It was one of the most influential aircraft of World War II and enabled Britain to take the fight to Nazi Germany from 1942 till the end of the war, hitting strategic targets and industry to weaken its war effort in an unrelenting stream of attacks. The Avro Lancaster bomber was almost a flying bomb bay, able to carry very large bomb loads of up to, but it was also modified to carry the largest non-nuclear bombs of war, like the 12,000 pound Torboy and the 22,000 pound Grand Slam, not to mention the famous bouncing bomb of the Dambusters. The Lancaster conducted 156,000 sorties and dropped 618,612 tons of bombs between 1942 and 45 just behind the B-17's 640,000 tonnes. Although the Lancaster was a very reliable aircraft, a huge number were lost to enemy fire, and of the 125,000 crew that flew the Lancasters, 55,000, about 44% were killed in action. But one of the most successful bombers of the war very nearly didn't come about if it wasn't for the ever resourceful designer Roy Chadwick. So today, we're looking at the British Lancaster bomber. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. Just as the RF had to fight off bandits attacking the UK in World War II, the internet can seem like a war zone too, with an almost unlimited supply of hackers, viruses, trojans, malwares, all trying to get into your computer. But you don't need the RAF to get rid of them. You can use a VPN or virtual private network and one of the best is run by Private Internet Access or PIA for short. With over 30 million downloads, 10 plus years of VPN experience and independently verified no logs policy, you can be sure that there are no trails that could be followed something that has been proven in court many times. It covers not only over 83 countries, but also has over 50 servers in 50 of the US states and works with all major streaming services. So you can watch TV events from anywhere in the world. And with one subscription, you can protect up to 10 devices at the same time, whether you're at home or on public Wi-Fi. PIA uses 100% open source software so if you want to go digging around to see just how private and secure it really is, you can. And they have a 4.6 out of five star rating from Trustpilot from over 8,000 users. So now you can enjoy all the benefits that PAA can offer. They're allowing me to repeat their holiday season offer of 83% off on the two year plan, plus an extra four months absolutely free, all for just $2.03 per month, or the equivalent in your currency. And all you have to do is use the link now showing, which is also in the top of the description below. The story of the Lancaster goes back to the late 1930s when the RAF was looking for a heavy bomber. At the time, most were two engine designs and although they may have been okay, there was no war on at the time and they will prove to be a poor match for the German buildup of the Luftwaffe. We'll go through some of the aircraft to get an idea of what the RAF had on the run up to the war. Firstly, the twin engine Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, which on the first night of the war dropped 13 tons of propaganda leaflets, as if that was gonna scare Hitler into stopping the war. A design flaw from the outset and a lack of understanding about flaps by the designer on large heavy monoplanes meant that the mid-set wings had a high incidence of attack, which made them better for takeoff and landing, but led to a nose down attitude when cruising and creating much more drag. They were later modified and used for glider tugs and parachute transport aircraft. The Bristol Blenheim was a twin engine bomber, which was fast but lightly armed and could only carry a thousand pound or 450 kilograms of bombs and was used as one of the first night bombers, something which the Lancaster would go on to perfect later. The Hadley Page Hamden was another twin engine bomber, which on the second day of the war made the first daylight RAF attack against German shipping in the North Sea, because at the time they were forbidden from bombing the German mainland, because factories were seen as private property by the government, a sort of gentleman's idea of how aerial campaigns should be fought, and something which was rather rapidly dropped 
along with the poorly armed Hamden, which was moved to mine laying and nighttime bombing. The first true heavy RAF bomber was the four engine short Sterling. Although this entered service in 1941, it was designed in 1936 with the insistence by the Air Ministry that it should have a wingspan of under 100 feet so it could fit into standard RAF hangars of the time, and as such had a limited ceiling height of just 16,500 feet. It also had a divided bomb bay which limited the carrying of bombs over 4,000 pounds or 1,800 kilos. In 1936, the British Air Ministry specification P-13-36 called for a new bomber to replace the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, the Hadley Page Hamden and Vickers Wellington. This would be a medium bomber for worldwide use which could perform shallow 30 degree dive bombing, carry heavy bomb loads of 8,000 pounds or 3,360 kilos or two 18 inch or 457 millimeter torpedoes and have a minimum cruising speed of 275 miles an hour at 15,000 feet. It also had to feature the provision for catapulted assisted launch for heavy loads on grass runways, which were still commonplace at the time, although this was dropped in 1938 as being impractical. Contracts were offered to Avro and Hadley Page. Avro would make what would become the Manchester and Hadley Page the Halifax, the Halifax being the backup to the Manchester. The Manchester was designed by Roy Chadwick, who placed great emphasis on the ease of manufacture and repair. It had a fuselage made up of longitudinal stringers or longerons throughout and covered in an external aluminium skin. The wings used a twin spar construction and six self-sealing fuel tanks which were contained within the wings, three in each. The rear wing was a similar construction and used a twin rudder and fin, which also gave the rear gunner good vision. The Manchester had a single large bomb bay with multiple racks that could carry a large variety of bomb loads up to 10,350 pounds or 4.6 tonnes. For defence it had three hydraulically powered turrets in the nose, upper mid fuselage and rear. The first Manchesters of the production line had many shortcomings including excessive tail flutter, hydraulic failures and faulty propeller feathering controls, but Avro were quick to fix them. The most obvious modification was the third central fin and rudder, but the biggest problem was with the Rolls-Royce Vulture engines and bearing failure, which forced the grounding of all Manchesters on at least two occasions. During active missions, more planes were lost due to engine failure than enemy fire, and to many of the crew that flew them, it was a flying disaster. Both Avro and Hadley Page had chosen the new Rolls-Royce Vulture engine, which turned out to be more of a turkey than a vulture, and one of the very few Rolls-Royce engines that weren't very good, primarily due to lack of development. These engines were an advanced design produced before the war, which was basically two Rolls-Royce 21 litre Peregrine V12 engines joined together and sharing a single crankshaft. This produced an X24 configuration. The output was originally meant to be 1750 horsepower, but problems meant that it had to be rev limited to a maximum 1500 horsepower. However, in service, the new engine was anything but reliable and had problems with big end bearing failures and overheating. The original bearings didn't use any silver as an economy measure, so they weren't hard enough, which led to the collapse of the bearing with a conrod and piston coming through the side of the engine. Rolls-Royce was confident that they could fix the issues but with the Battle of Britain and all their efforts being put into supplying and updating the already and almost as powerful and lighter Merlin, the Vulture was eventually dropped. The two Vulture engines were also underpowered, producing at best 1500 horsepower each in order to try and keep up the reliability. This could turn a single engine failure into the loss of an entire aircraft because one engine just couldn't keep it in the air. In reality, a bomber the size of a Manchester or Halifax needed two 2,500 horsepower engines. Both Hadley Page and Avro were given the heads up by Rolls-Royce that they didn't have the resources to develop the Vulture and made the decision to change from two Vulture engines to four smaller Merlins, a tactic that similar sized American and Russian bombers were also using which transformed the aircraft. Realising the need to make either a whole new bomber or fix the existing one, Chadwick and his team took the basic frame of a Manchester which they believed to be a good plane 
and redesigned new longer wings to allow four Merlin engines and the newly unitized Power Egg nacelle. This Power Egg was an engine with all the ancillary equipment and cowling in one module that could be quickly changed for maintenance or swapped between different applications that had been designed to use them. These Power Eggs could then be sent for maintenance elsewhere instead of working on them in situ and new ones installed without waiting to a much more forgiving and reliable aircraft. During its production, there would be only two further major revisions, the Lancaster B2, which would have the Bristol Hercules air-cooled radial engine, as due to the restricted supply of Merlins for fighters, and in the end, just 300 B2s were built. And the last major revision was the B3, which used Packard Merlins built in the US, but was effectively the same as the B1, and both were built concurrently at Avro's Newton Heath factory. Although it was originally built by the Avro company, demand outstripped Avro's ability to make enough Lancasters, so other companies were brought in to help, including Armstrong Whitworth, Austin Motors, Metropolitan Vickers, Vickers Armstrong, and the Victory Aircraft Company of Canada, which built 430 Lancasters. Sections of the planes were built at dispersed locations around the country under control of several factories before being assembled at the final factory. Over time, and as special operations arrived, modifications were done to small batches of aircraft, such as adding airborne radar and upgraded radio for working at sea, engine upgrades to the two stage supercharger similar to the Spitfire, electronic countermeasures, and a bulged bomb bay doors to allow greater bomb loads, to name a few. There were also special versions made for a variety of other uses, but some of the most famous were for the Torboy 12,000 pound 5.4 ton bomb, the Grand Slam 22,000 pound or 10 ton bomb, and Upkeep, the bouncing bomb of the Dam Busters fame. This is what made the Lancaster so useful, fully utilizing the long bomb bay with average bomb loads of 12,000 pounds or 5.4 tons but could be pushed to 14,000 pounds or 6.3 tons. For the Grand Slam, the bulged bomb bay doors which were used for the tour boy were removed altogether and the internal area fared over, so the Grand Slam effectively sat outside of the aircraft. They also removed the front and mid upper turrets, the H2S radar, rear turret armor, and even the toolbox and crew ladder to lose weight. The aircraft was also fitted with uprated engines and stronger undercarriage. Because of the extra weight, only smooth runways could be used and with the most experienced pilots. In 1944, Avro upgraded the Lancaster with larger wings and a longer fuselage and a two-stage supercharger engine, and this would become the Avro Lincoln. Though it arrived too late for the war, it did become the last piston engine bomber to be flown by the RAF. The Lancaster was held in high regard not only by the RAF but also the Germans. Adolf Galland, commander of the Luftwaffe fighters, considered the Lancaster to be the best night bomber of the war. Only 35 Lancasters completed more than 100 successful operations each, and 3,249 out of 7,377 were lost in action. The last flight of an RAF squadron Lancaster was made on the 15th of October 1956, when it was flown to a maintenance unit to be scrapped. Today, there are 17 Lancasters left in museums around the world, two of which are airworthy and flown at events and air shows in Canada and the UK. Hopefully, one more, which is based at East Kirkby in Lincolnshire and finishing up restoration, will be joining them in the not too distant future. A fitting end for a 1936 design that was considered a failure at the time and went on to play a large part in helping save the free world. So I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did then don't forget to thumbs up, subscribe and share and thanks to all of our patrons for their ongoing support.